All right. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to put myself on video for just a moment and, and then uh, I'm going to come off a of video after we get started. But I want to uh, thank everyone for being here. This is our first of um, a series of monthly best practices webinars, master classes that we're starting. So we're excited to start this process. And uh, again, my name is Sal Sylvester. I've met a lot of folks here that are on the session today. And uh, again, welcome. So big picture, this is part of a bigger vision that we have for Coach Metrics. And part of what we're trying to do in 2020 is really create more community across the, co the, the, the connection, the, the community and connection across uh, the Coach Metrics Network. And we're, we're going to be doing this in really two ways. One, you'll see some features inside of Coach Metrics over time that will connect our coaches through the platform, but we're also going to be doing a lot more offline things to get people connected. And this is our first step in that, in that process. So our vision is uh, that we can do really two things together. Number one, share best practices, ideas on how to grow. Uh, our coaching businesses, ideas on how to be super effective leadership and executive coaches. That's one component. But then also imagine if you live in Omaha, Nebraska, and you need a coach in New York City, being able to go out to the Coach Metrics platform, finding people who have a similar process, maybe their own unique coaching style and skill, but they're guided by a similar coaching process and being able to engage with them on larger coaching engagements. So you're gonna see more of this type of connection coming as we move forward in, in 2020. For today, this is a masterclass, the first in a series of monthly masterclasses that we'll be, uh, we'll be sharing. And our opportunity here today is really to talk about two things. The, the focus for our conversation today is getting the most out of behavioral measurement. And, we want this to be about certainly coach metrics and some of the features that will enable you to engage stakeholders and measure behavior change in your coaching engagements. But we also want this to be about coaching in general. So it's not just about coach metrics. So today's session is, these sessions are going to be exclusively for coach metrics subscribers. That's part of the benefit of being a coach metrics subscriber. And um, we've invited a few other folks that have shown some interest in coach metrics. So we've got some special guests on the call today. Uh, but as we, as I tee up the conversation and I'll share some content to start with, I do want to open it up and, and make sure that we've got some really good discussion going across the group today. We had about 60 people sign up for, for the masterclass today. I'm expecting we'll probably have 20 or 30 people on the call as we, uh, as we move forward. And um, let's open it up for conversation as we get started. So I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna take myself off video and, um, but we're gonna, keep, uh, we're gonna keep sharing the screen. Let me, oh, looks like I, all right, I need to stop my video, not the screen share. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? Um, here's our roadmap for today. We're gonna identify and define three keys that are really important in stakeholder-centered coaching. And many of you are very familiar with Marshall Goldsmith's work. Stakeholder-centered coaching is his methodology. And I had the good fortune of writing a book with Marshall about this methodology and how it works with coach metrics. So we're going to talk about some important keys in engaging stakeholders. And then we're gonna really get into the five, what I call must haves when we're engaging stakeholders. And then as we go through each of those must haves, we're gonna talk about the best practices for each of those must haves and how you can really leverage some of the features inside of Coach Metrics. I think that's gonna be a great time where you can take yourself off a of mute, ask a question, share an idea, maybe a best practice that you're using within your engagements um, to effectively engage stakeholders and measure behavioral change. So let's jump in right now. Uh, a little bit about Coach Metrics for those who haven't heard the story. Uh, Coach Metrics came out of a need 
that we had in our own coaching and leadership development practice. And years ago, I started noticing when we were running these long-term leadership development engagements that many of the participants that were in our programs, when our, when our action plans were paper-based, they either weren't building their action plans or they weren't doing it to the extent that really drove behavioral change. And that just really fascinated me because our clients are paying a, a lot of money for us to deliver these services. So that was one of the first things that we started noticing. When there was paper-based action plans, there wasn't the transparency between the coach, the participant, and the coach's manager that there really needed to be in order to drive change. The second, and I'll never forget this experience that I had when the director of information security sat down the first day of a seven-month leadership development program, and he looked down at, at his desk where there was this beautiful workbook in front of him from our leadership program. And he looked up at me and he said, I haven't used a pen and paper in years. And this was about probably five or six years ago. And this trend has continued. And it really made me start thinking about where is the future of coaching and the future of leadership development, the future of work. And from my point of view, it's, it wasn't going to be on paper. And so that was another driver of coach metrics. And then the third and maybe the most important driver is we needed a methodology to measure behavioral change. And most coaches don't actually do this. Most leadership development programs just measure participant reactions. We wanted to measure whether people were changing as a result of our uh, leadership development program. So uh, coach metrics is really a system that has been built by coaches and made for coaches because we wanted action planning to be transparent. We wanted to have a simple and easy to use platform for getting content online. And we wanted to have a measure, we wanted to have a system and a platform for measuring behavioral change. So initially so that we could set our business apart, but so that you can set your business apart as well. And we can all make a bigger difference in this world. So that's a little bit of background on coach metrics. Let's get into our topic for today. And as I mentioned before, we are really focused today in this best practice masterclass on how do we engage stakeholders and how do we, how do we really best leverage behavioral measurement in executive and leadership coaching? And really part of what's driving some of the underlying principles in coach metrics is this idea of stakeholders. And again, as I mentioned, Marshall Goldsmith has this beautiful methodology around stakeholder-centered coaching. And there are three really important characteristics or keys to the stakeholder-centered coaching approach. And um, And the, the, the three keys are, number one, in stakeholder-centered coaching, there's an emphasis on engaging stakeholders. So it's not just about the coach, certainly not about the coach, and it's not just about the participant, it's also about stakeholders. And so who are stakeholders? Stakeholders are people who are impacted by the leader's behavior. Number two, they're willing to go along on this leadership development journey with the leader. And number three, they're willing to change their point of view about how they see the leader. So the first key to a stakeholder-centered coaching approach is that we're engaging other people in the leader's development. The second key in stakeholder-centered coaching approach is that there's an, there's an emphasis on feed forward. So we hear a lot about feedback and feedback is important. In fact, it's a very important part of coach metrics. In stakeholder-centered coaching, there's an emphasis on feed forward, which is really about ideas and suggestions for the future. And, and so we can't do anything about the past, but we certainly can uh, do some things about the future. And so um, part of what coach metrics does is it captures data on both feedback and feed forward. We just had a question come in and people are asking, hey, what's the difference between stakeholders and participants? So let me define that. That's a very good question. Inside of coach metrics, we really have three roles. We have the coach. We have the participant. The participant in coach metrics is a coachee. It's the person that's being coached. And then there's a third role inside of coach metrics. We call them supporters. 
And they're the equivalent of what we're referring to today as stakeholders. So supporters or stakeholders are people who are impacted by that leader's behavior. They're willing to go on that leadership journey with the leader and provide ongoing feedback and feed forward on whether that leader's changing or not. Thanks for that question. And then the third key to stakeholder approach is that there's a focus on both behavioral change and perception change. And I'll show you a little bit of data a little bit later in this masterclass on why this is important. But what we all know is, you know, we can get, we can go through a coaching conversation or a session or a workshop and I can go make a change today quickly, but it's unlikely that other people will see that change unless I do some very specific things. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. So what we found in our work, and I think Marshall's found this in his work, you'll, you'll see some data from leadership as a contact sport later in this masterclass, perception change is often harder to make than behavioral change. So those are the three keys. Number one, we emphasize stakeholders. Number two, we emphasize feed forward. Number three, we focus on both behavioral change and perception change. And again, the three roles in coach metrics, one, we've got a coach. Number two, a participant, that's the person being coached. And number three, the supporter is the equivalent of a stakeholder that we're referring to today. Okay, so let's get into the best practices part of, of this conversation today. And um, there are five must-haves for implementing a stakeholder-centered coaching approach. And there are a whole bunch of other things that you can add into any coaching engagement, but these are the, these are the foundational components that if you just look at doing stakeholder-centered coaching, you really have to have in place. Number one, a leader identifies a development goal. Number two, the leader goes public with that goal. Number three, the leader builds an action plan. Number four, the leader follows up consistently with stakeholders. And number five, the leader measures results. So these are the five components, the five must-haves, if you will, for a stakeholder approach. And all of these components are built into coach metrics. So what we're going to do is we're going to peel back the onion a little bit here on each of these five must-haves. And we're going to take a look at some of the best practices that you can implement using coach metrics to fulfill these must-haves in a coach, in a stakeholder-centered coaching approach. And as we go through this, I would invite you to unmute yourself and either ask a question or uh, challenge what's up here or say, hey, this is, how, this is what we found to be really effective in our coaching practice. Um, so the first um, component is the leader identifies a development goal. So oftentimes, uh, at least in our coaching practice, this happens um, after a leader goes through a 360 process. It might be an online 360. It might be um, a set of confidential stakeholder interviews. And out of all of that data, the leader identifies one, two, or three things to work on. And there's a couple of best practices that we've identified <coughs> inside of Coach Metrics that might help. And so I'm going to switch from this PowerPoint, and I'm going to go over to a Coach Metrics platform. All right, so inside of Coach Metrics, when we start thinking about getting our participants to get clear on an action plan, I'm going to go into Greg Smithy's account. Some of you have seen Greg before. This is an updated project. Inside of Coach Metrics, it's super easy to build an action plan. There's an action plan section. All you have to do is click on the plus button, and you can add a goal, a behavioral statement, and some additional details. Now, part of what I want to show you, most of you already know how that works on Coach Metrics because you're using it with your clients. But one thing that we've discovered is and created is I've got a couple tabs open here. Is we've built a resource, it's actually a collection that we call Create Your Action Plan. And what we're able to do with that collection is have three simple steps. Number one, this is how you create a goal. And so we show what a smart goal format looks like. We give them some sample goals so that they have clarity on what that goal statement look like, might look like. And then step number two, 
which is the second step in our action planning process, we show some examples of behaviors. Uh, we, we describe the characteristics of what they look like, and then we give some examples of what behaviors um, would be serving inside of that action plan to be a pulse feedback survey item. And then number three, we give them examples of what they might put inside of the body of their action plan. We typically uh, encourage our coaches to get action items in there as well as what support they need. So then once we've got this resource built, we're then able to send it to whatever coaches we, we're coaching. And so Greg Smithy, as he's in his process of building his action plan, we send him this resource so he has some examples of what an action plan looks like and, um, and he's got some clarity on how to create that action plan. Um, I, I'm always amazed, regardless of level of leadership, how much people struggle with really creating a concise and clear action plan. So that's, that's best practice number one, which is build a resource that you can then use across all of your projects to help support your leaders in creating that action plan. All right, best practice number two is comment on the action plan. So many of you may know this. If I look at one of Greg's goals or two of Greg's goals, you'll notice that there's some space underneath that goal for the coach to comment on the action plan. So as that leader is building his or her goals, this is just a nice, simple way for you to share your feedback, give them different ideas on how they might improve the goal, or maybe even check in between coaching sessions on how they're progressing toward that goal. So we start to minimize all of the email exchange that goes back and forth because it's all happening right inside of Coach Metrics. And by the way, when you do these things inside of Coach Metrics, it sends an email to the participants so they always know that you've updated their action plan. So those are a couple of best practices for, um, for identifying that development goal. Number one, create a resource. Number two, make comments. Um, does anybody have any comments on that, questions, or what are you doing around helping your leaders identify a development goal and maybe even something that you're doing differently inside of Coach Metrics? Feel free to unmute and make a comment. All right, if, you, if you've got any thoughts, just let us know. I'm gonna go on to the second component. Again, second must have in stakeholder centered coaching, the leader has to go public with the goal. So part of the methodology is one, I get clear on what I'm focused on, and then number two, I go public with that goal. And, and the, Part of the reason that we do that is to just let people know what we're working on. So there's a couple of best practices here. Some of this is online and some of this is offline, meaning some of these can happen inside of coach metrics. Some of this is just best practice with stakeholder centered coaching. Number one, you have to enroll your supporters verbally. And here's what I mean. Sometimes we find that people that uh, coaches that are using coach metrics will add their supporters, their stakeholders into coach metrics or their, their, their coaches, their participants will add those supporters into coach metrics and coach metrics will send those supporters a welcome message, but it's really not best practice. What we recommend is that you have your coaches have a conversation with those supporters personally, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe even in a group and say, Hey, these are the things that I'm working on. I would love for you to be a supporter. Here's what being a supporter means. Um, I'm going to check in with you on about a monthly basis and I'm gonna ask you for your feedback and your feed forward on how I'm doing. And oh, by the way, we're gonna send you a series of pulse feedback requests from Coach Metrics on a regular basis. Would you be willing to go along with me on this leadership journey? Thank you. So there's a verbal enrollment that needs to happen and we have found that there's a strong correlation between enrolling those supporters verbally and then getting their engagement throughout that entire coaching process and, and having really good, consistent, 
pulse feedback results through that coaching process. So enroll verbally. There's a second best practice that we think is, is important in that leader going public with that goal. And it, it really involves the manager. And we, th we call it manager calibration. And so what does that mean? That means that before we begin any kind of measurement, we want to make sure the leader is working on the right things. So they've got that 360 data that's come back in. They create their action plan inside of Coach Metrics. Now they need to go calibrate that action plan with their manager. We do not want to get to the end of a coaching engagement and say, hey, great, Sal focused on all of these things and he improved, but he worked on the wrong things. So this calibration process is a really critical component. That calibration process, in, that can happen. I'd love to hear what you're doing. Uh, in our executive coaching engagements, we will literally have a three-way coaching session with the manager, the participant, and the coach. Uh, sometimes in some of our more targeted coaching where it's not as in-depth of an engagement, we just encourage that manager and that participant to work together. And sometimes it's just sending that action plan from Coach Metrics to the manager to get their input. Feel free to come under uh, or come off mute and, and let me know how, how are you engaging that participant's manager in coaching? John, it looks like you just came off mute. Yeah, Sal, how are you? Uh, this good, is John. how are you, John? Yeah, I, I'm good. I'm sorry I'm late and okay. I uh, got, got a little uh, delayed. So yeah, so I, I, for me personally, I, I never get past this stage without having a face-to-face, -face, either by video or live mm -hmm. in person, a meeting with the coachee and their supervisor. Because I mean, to your earlier point, the last thing that I want to do is get three months into it and have a midpoint check-in with the supervisor and say, hey, Sal's doing great on collaboration. Yeah. And your supervisor says, you know what, I'm not interested in that at all. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's real, for me, it's really, really important to develop that relationship with the, with the coachee supervisor, you know, early and particularly as it comes to setting the goals. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, John. How how long does that typically take you? Like, what, what does that look like for you? You mean how long does that session take, or how long? Does yeah, it take to get there? no. How did how does that? Well, let's start with how long does that session take? But yeah, that is that's another interesting question. How long does it get there, too? Yeah, I usually plan on two hours, uh, mm -hmm. but oftentimes, uh, sort of the mean is uh, probably around an hour and a quarter, something like okay. that, depending on yep. how much leg work we've done beforehand and how much the coachee has you know, communicated and been working with their supervisor up to that point. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and we've. We're, we're probably about, I'm guessing, uh, maybe three or four sessions into uh, the process when we're at that point where we're going to have that sit down. But it, it, clearly that's not the first time that the supervisor and I have had a conversation. Yeah, that, that's almost exactly how our process works as well, John. It's usually around that fourth session for us because we'll do a visioning session around coaching session number two, depending on the engagement. But it's usually about third or fourth session where we're pulling in that um, we're pulling in that supervisor into the process. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Hey, it looks like Frank just came off of uh, mute. Frank, did you have uh, some thoughts? Yeah. Just, um, hi, Sal. Uh, hey, on Frank. the enroll supporters verbally, um, yeah. that definitely makes a big difference. But, but it's, it's interesting to me because sometimes the coachee will say, well, one in particular I can think of, uh, recently said, wait a minute, you want me to ask these other people on my team to provide their feedback about me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. and it's funny because we, we kind of say, yeah, of course, that's the whole point of this, but, but it doesn't really hit them until it really hits them. And yeah. I, I, just, I just thought that was so interesting because mm -hmm. it starts to change the whole culture of the organization when you are transparent about feedback. And so, um, you know, this guy was not thinking along those lines at all. So, mm -hmm. uh, just an interesting <laughs> experience yeah. there. But. It's, it's really interesting. And I, I think there's a, um, to me, there's this multiplier effect that happens with this methodology mm -hmm. because now that leader, and especially if that leader's in an executive role, they're now giving other people permission to say, Hey, I've got some things to work on. And 
you know, um, maybe I should start asking other people for feedback and feed forward as well. So there's this nice multiplier effect that can happen mm -hmm. with this methodology. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. Um, one feature I want to quickly show you in coach metrics, uh, and, and it, it's kind of hidden. So some of you may or may not have seen this underneath the goal or on top of the goals feature, there's this button that says share action plan and either the coach or the participant can share their action plan. It doesn't give people input into coach metrics. It simply emails, and this is an exact image of what it would look like. It emails that action plan to whoever that participant chooses. So it could be to their coach. They could send it to themselves. They could send it to their supporters. They could send it to their manager or anybody else. So there's that feature to help support that calibration process. That's really why, why we built that. All right, I'm going to keep going. Thanks for that input, Frank and John. That's really helpful. Um, the third component is the leader builds an action plan. And we really kind of covered this already, but there's a couple of best practices inside of coach metrics that I think are important. And I often get the question, which is, well, who, who should be a leader's supporters um, or a leader's stakeholders? And my answer is typically, generally people who are impacted by that leadership behavior. So you might have different supporters for different goals. And when you add supporters into coach metrics, it automatically assigns all of those supporters to all the goals. There's a way to remove your supporters from certain goals, if that makes sense. So for example, when I go into Greg's first goal, I can edit that goal. And if I don't want Robin and Steve to be providing pulse feedback on that goal, I just uncheck them. Once those supporters are added into coach metrics, they'll show up underneath the, the specific goal. And then you can save the goal. So um, if you find yourself in a situation where you have a, a participant who needs different supporters for different goals, you have that capability inside of coach metrics. So that's number one. And number two, it's also not uncommon for people, for some of those supporters over time to leave an organization, or maybe they go out on maternity or paternity leave, and, or, or maybe um, uh, they switch over to another team. It's also possible to delete those supporters so that they can be removed from that project. So those are a couple of best practices around, um, around coach metrics and building that action plan. I'm curious for you, what have you done with building an action plan, whether it's related to coach metrics or not, that you've found to be a best practice in, in your work? Anybody have any thoughts? Sal? Yes. This is CB. How are you? CB, how are you? <laughs> up, in, up in Fort Collins. Hey, you got it. <laughs> you got it. Getting ready to get married. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank wow. you. That's Thank awesome. you. That's awesome. So here's my question. I think it's, I love, absolutely love the part that uh, says the coachee uh, goes public because as, as we know who have a background in psych, it's incredibly hard to change behavior. And if you're doing it in secrecy, it's much, much harder. Right. My question is, do the supporters have a chance to give input into this program because you know you can you can perceive yourself in certain ways and say okay i'm going to take this plan this road of action to change the behavior but it may not be in sync with what your supporters are thinking about mm -hmm. so your question is your question do they have input into that action plan is is that yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. this is a very very good point so the answer is a resounding yes. The action plan should be based on some kind of data gathering that happens up front. So in our coaching engagements, there's typically a 360 process, whether that's online or verbal. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be that. You could go through a feedback or a feed forward exercise with your supporters and gather their input on what should be inside of that action plan. So up front, yes, they should have input on what goes into that action plan based on that data. And then throughout the coaching engagement, and this is really, um, this is really step four, which is the leader follows up consistently with those supporters or those stakeholders. That leader should be having a conversation 
with those stakeholders every month saying, and, and here's how the conversation looks. It's very simple. It's, hey, I've been working on fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're working on. How have I done in the last 30 days? What are your ideas for the next 30 days? And those ideas then should feed back in the par- into the participants action plan and coach metrics and really help that leader change behavior. So this is the part where we're focusing on both the behavior and the perception change. So yes, up front they should have some input. And then number two, along the way, they've got input as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, CB. I appreciate that question. It's a really good point. And you know, part of the reason why we do this, and this is data from Marshall and some of you um, may have seen this. This is an article from a while ago in the Harvard Business Review, Leadership's Contact Sport. And, and, and Marshall found this, this data that, uh, or, or did this research that said, hey, when a leader doesn't follow up consistently with people who are impacted by them, it's very rare that they'll change their perceptions. And so he assesses people's um, Uh, score and whether the leader's changing from a negative three to a positive three. Zero represents, hey, the leader's not changing from the point of view of those supporters. And so if I go back to this original chart, when the leader did no follow-up with his stakeholders, there was no difference in how people perceive that leader than in a control group that had never been through any kind of coaching or leadership training. When the leader did a little bit of follow-up, some follow-up, frequent follow-up, and consistent follow-up, there was a significant difference in how other people perceive that leader. So part of what we're trying to do in Coach Metrics is help support that process of follow-up with your stakeholders, and that's really what the Pulse Feedback process is about, and, um, and help change those perceptions in addition to those behaviors. Um, I'll show you one other one other uh, feature inside of Coach Metrics. If you haven't seen this, when you scroll to the supporters area, that participant has the ability to send an email to their supporters. And we built three very simple canned messages. One is a welcome message. One is a follow-up message to just remind that supporter that they're in this leadership program and Thanks for continuing to help me out. And then there's also the ability to create your own custom message. If you want, you can build these messages and then schedule them and send them at a later date as well. So the follow-up ideally happens in person. The follow-up also happens through the ongoing pulse feedback process and coach metrics. The the follow-up can also happen via email. My strong bias is let's have these conversations between the leader and her stakeholders because that's what's going to ultimately help that leader create the most set of behavioral change. Okay, so let's go to the last uh, component of the stakeholder-centered coaching process, and it's the leader measures results. And um, yeah, go ahead. Who's that? I just want to jump in while we're still hey, talking. Robin. About yeah. Plan. So absolutely. Uh, Briggs has a um, question. Oh, great. Um, so, do you find that putting more structure around the ideas input is helpful? Putting more structure around, what was that input? The ideas input is helpful. For example, asking start, stop, continue. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, Robin. Can you provide more context? Put input behind the what? I, I'm sorry, I just I, didn't understand the question. Can I mute myself? Oh yeah, hey Jennifer. Hello, so the question is, um, you know, it's just asking for ideas too broad of a question for some of the oh. statements. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you put the question in the format of like, ask, you know, one thing that they could start, stop or continue or right. some other kind of um, question structure to help give mm-hmm. supporters more guidance, or does that structure actually limit, um, limit them in terms of what they might give as ideas? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would open it up to other folks on this call. What do you think? I'll, I'll give you my point of view as well, but I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what other folks think. So as opposed to just having a general um, question of how's it going, you're saying, what should I start, stop, or continue, or some structure, and does that structure 
limit the feedback that people might give? Uh, this is CB. Yes, yeah, CB. I think that having some structure is great. And you can always add to that structure a footnote that says, you know, feel free to go outside of the structure. But I think in today's world with, with the craziness that's going on and how our minds are multifaceted, having some guidelines helps them think through what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Any other points of view? Um, I like the simple frame. I think start, stop, continues great. Sometimes we'll use a simple plus, delta, what, what has gone well in the last 30 days um, and what would you like to see more of, less of, or differently. Sometimes we'll frame it in that language as well, more of, less of, or differently. So I, I agree. I, I think you're, those, the, those frames give people enough structure, but you're not leading the witness, so to speak. So I, I like it. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, uh, Susan, did you have a thought? Yeah, I just, I didn't want to talk over you there. Um, just, it kind of adds to what they're saying, but it's a challenge that I have faced. When I do the survey, people still have these really embedded mental maps around. If I rate somebody, that comment box should be about how, um, why, how I justify that rating, what I observed, what mm. I saw. Right. And I, I found with me that with, and I just finished this conversation this morning, um, when the leader goes back and says, yes, I understand why you rated me that, what opportunity do you see for me in the next 30 to 60 days? And that becomes a verbal conversation. It mm -hmm. really reinforces the process. I yeah. just find it hard sometimes for people to project out in written comments. They're much better to do it in uh, conversational ways as yeah. a follow-up. And then that builds the leader's rapport with the supporter as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think the platform, we don't want the platform to get in the way of the conversations. Um, CB? Yeah, I also think I agree with everything that was said. I think that the missing component here is when you go out to let, you know, people know that you're working on this behavior change. I think it's critically important for you to give them permission. Mm. You know, I think that people don't give the feedback because they don't have permission, especially in this world of people being afraid of pol not being politically correct or what have you. I always find if you just make that extra effort to say, I, I would like this feedback. I'm giving you permission to tell me. You can be mm -hmm. kind about it. You don't have to be obnoxious, but please give me that. I'm giving you that permission. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, love it. I love both of them. So, uh, Susan, you, your comment about the comment box, the, the way Coach Metrics is structured today, of course, there's the graphical data, and then the numerical data shows up beneath that as well. And that's what we would call the feedback. And then the comments, the way that we've got them framed inside of the survey is, what are your ideas and suggestions for the next 30 days? And so we, this is the feed forward component. And what I hear you saying is, Susan, um, people are um, trying to use that, that box to justify their answer and the feedback. And you really want to encourage those conversations. Some people will write the feed forward in there. The majority I have found do not. Oh, but instead of kind of giving up there, I have the leader go back with follow-up questions. And mm -hmm. so okay. I do face-to-face -face enrolling the supporter, and then I would do the face-to-face -face in the follow-up feed forward section. I just think a lot of people are just habituated into, if I rate somebody, I better have a good justification. Yeah. And the justification is always driving, looking in the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I just find if anybody has a shortcut to that or they found a way to get more feed forward comments in the comment box, I'm open to that, hearing yep. that. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so I love your, your point of view, CB, on we've got to give them permission. I am always curious, too, when we look at the results in our engagements, um, the leaders who have created the most amount of trust we have found they get the most amount of feed forward comments inside of coach metrics. Um, 
and like an overwhelming amount of comments, like super in-depth paragraphs of feed forward. So I, does anyone have any other ideas in addition to giving permission on how to engage those stakeholders and providing more feed forward and coach metrics? Frank's looked like, looks like uh, you. Um, oh yeah. So I, yeah. I just, um, I was just going to say um, first, I love the 360 feedback structure of the, mm -hmm. you know, a two question survey that you can get the coachee excited about asking supporters. This is not a 30 question survey. So it's very short, specific to the point. Um, I like the idea that was shared about following up if you don't get feed forward. I also find that a bit that a lot of my coaches, supporters don't necessarily provide a lot of feed forward, but they do provide pretty detailed feedback. But the other thing that I've tried that seems to work pretty well is I've asked these my, some of my coaches to include their spouses or significant mm -hmm. others in the loop. And one coachee did that. And until the fifth or fourth line of this, the feedback, he didn't realize it, whether it was his boss who was responding or his wife. And because wow. they were wow. so, and so it really becomes a validating exercise in terms of what, what people seem to be saying is pretty consistent across the board. Mm -hmm. But I, but as far as getting feed forward, I agree that might, that's sometimes been tough for me at least. And I, I don't yeah. really have any other suggestions or thoughts. Except the thing yeah. I love the thought about just having that be part of an in-person follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. So one, the permission up front and then the, the in-person follow-up. Yeah. Yeah, I think also this is, this might be a coach responsibility. This is CB again. Um, given today's world of people being concerned about being sued, they put things in writing. I think the, per, the, the, the person who's being coached has to realize that don't be offended if people don't write to you. There is a concern about what would happen with the information. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think as a coach, we have a responsibility to say, you know, do what you feel comfortable. You, you want to draw this information out, but realize that if no one speaks up, it's not something you're doing wrong. So give them a comfort bed. Yep. Awesome. We've got a, just a couple minutes left. Uh, Jackie, it looks like you've got your hand raised inside of um, Zoom. Is there a question or thought you had? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Sure can, yeah. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the conversation. A couple quick points. I think that welcome email, especially if it's customized, yes, and has happened after the participant had verbalized, you know, their invitation to supporters, goes a long way mm -hmm. uh, towards getting the type of information that you hope for. Uh, second point would be I haven't seen a lot of feed forward either. Like the specific, mm -hmm. I hear, oh, they're doing great, no ideas, and that's you know, right. I just finished up an engagement with one of my leaders I worked with and he started with high marks. He got some specifics and then it just became, everything's great. And so that's not necessarily helpful, right? Mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, and a, maybe a third and final point is I'm trying to encourage the people I'm coaching to say, go in there. You can send a group email to your participants and we yeah. keep it anonymous. So we say yeah. not anybody individual, you know, and thank them for their feedback and say, you really appreciate it and, and please, provide more next round. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to have the leader do that and um, have them be aware of how many people are their supporters who are responding. And, you know, sometimes we only get 50% of, yeah. of the supporters. Uh, so Jackie. that that's an issue, you know. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, really good point. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry I went so long. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Go ahead, CB. Jackie, I think there's, there's great feedback actually in, in a comment that comes back that says, that's great. I think the follow-up question as a coach we want to encourage is, tell me what's great. Right. What did I do that lot, was great? Yeah, right. exactly. There's a lot of learning in that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. It's amazing how fast uh, 45 minutes goes. And I, I want to honor your time. I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes. Um, a couple of things that we've experimented with on our side. When we first started using coach metrics, we would have the pulse feedback rounds go out every 30 days. We found that we were creating some survey fatigue. We've now shifted that to about every 45 days. And on 
really long engagements, or if there's a phase two for the engagement, we might even shift that out to 60 or 90 days. So play around with um, your timing. You can also adjust the scale. This particular scale is showing negative two to positive two, but you can make that one to 10, one to 100, one to seven, negative five to positive five. You can customize that scale. And don't forget that you can also set the pulse feedback schedule and just automate it and not have to worry about it. Um, so those are a couple of tips from our end. Um, I'd love to ask one more question. I also realize some people need to sign off. Uh, as we move forward with these best practice conversations, what topics are important for you that you'd like to see us cover related to leadership and executive coaching? Tell you what, I'll, I'll just plant that seed and uh, you'll see a follow-up email come out with, from us um, early next week, probably Tuesday, that'll include a recording of this masterclass today. And I'll ask that question inside of that email. Just respond back to, the, back to us. We would absolutely love to hear your point of view so that these are a valuable, really good, good use of your time. Folks, thanks um, so Sal? much. I, yes. have a, I have one for you. I'm not sure That's, it's in your bandwidth, but it's the contractual side. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. And, and um, say more about that, CB. Is it the literally contracting, uh, like a contract with a coachee or coaches, or is it more of the contracting in a coaching engagement, the agreements we set up between a coach and coachee? It's more the second. I mean, we yeah. have the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches, ACEC. We have a webinar coming up in April with three attorneys, one from the United States, one from Canada, and one from England that, that will talk to the audience about what needs to be in their contract, what is missing, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't okay. know if it's in Great. your bandwidth, but it might be related to best practices. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful suggestion. Thanks, CB. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, so honored to be part of this group and to start really building this community. Uh, thanks for being here today and uh, look forward to staying in touch and really support each other in the very important work that we're doing to make this world a better place. So thanks for joining me. Stay tuned for a follow-up newsletter from us with a recording from today's session, as well as updates on uh, both features that we're releasing, as well as the next masterclass in April. Thanks, everyone.